Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Live at Five. I am your host, Kevin Atkinson, curator with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. And today, I thought that we would celebrate a little piece of Cranbrook that all of us see when we're here on campus, but I somehow have neglected in 18 months of doing these tours, and that is the fabulous Cranbrook light fixtures. And these are all around campus. And you may know that there are multiple types of the light fixtures. These were designed by architect and former head of the architecture department, Dan Hoffman. I've talked about Hoffman on lots of previous Live at Fives. Um, he was the architect in residence who probably did more to revive the tradition at Cranbrook that was so uh, such a passion project of George Booth and of Aliel Saarinen, and that's the arts and crafts ideal that uh, uh, the architect should be a creator, should design arts. If you believe, like William Morris and the other arts and crafts leaders, that architecture is the mother art, and so therefore all other arts are simply subservient or serving architecture, then the architect should design everything. And that is true here at Cranbrook. And it was true, especially in the uh, early Sarnin era, when Aliel Sarnin was designing everything at Cranbrook from teacups and plates to furniture and logos and buildings and master plans. And then in the 80s and 90s, we revived that spirit and so we end up with wonderful results like these whimsical lights designed by Dan Hoffman for Cranbrook. Now, Dan Hoffman started after a pretty tumultuous period in the architecture department at the academy where Daniel Liebskind had led a department that was quite experimental. And Daniel Liebskind uh, uh, really thought of architecture as a sort of uh, paper practice. So though Daniel Liebskin would go on to build many wonderful buildings at Cranbrook, he was mostly doing drawings, and then he was doing sort of experiments out in the wood. Uh, Dan Hoffman wanted to do something different. He wanted to bring back to Cranbrook this idea of making. And so what I'm showing you here is my favorite of the multiple uh, Cranbrook light fixtures, and I think that will have a chance to look at all four today. This one is, um, some people call it the Frisbee golf basket uh, light fixture. I think see it more in the realm of sort of mid-century modernism and the work of Charles and Ray Eames. It really has this very whimsical character to it. And it's made of this folded steel plate, then connected with painted stainless, or painted steel wires. And like all of the Hoffman lights, it is indirect. And so uh, it is on a timer or on a light sensor, and it is a cold, dark June day here in Michigan. And so half the street lights have turned on. Um, this side of the street is still not. And this idea of shooting the lights up and then reflecting it back down, what we might call a torchere, is something that Aliel Sarnin did quite a bit of. And so think of the torchers in Sarnin House or at the Art Museum. Uh, Aliel Sarnin loved the idea of reflected light, and it's something that Dan Hoffman picks up with his little light fixtures. Now, you might ask yourself, didn't Aliel Sarnin design light fixtures for Cranbrook? And indeed he did, but his were extraordinarily site-specific. So the only Aliel Sarnin exterior lighting that we have is either sort of attached to buildings like sconces, though in many cases he did not design uh, sconces, so we don't have Aliel Sarnin lighting. Or it's uh, integrated into the architecture like at Kingswood, where the stone columns will become light fixtures. And then the only time that he really designed a street light is over at the School for Boys with the uh, wonderful bronze cast lights with very simple glass globes. So when in the 1980s and 90s Cranbrook was ramping up for what we call the Millennium Projects and was designing all sorts of new campus buildings and structures, lighting became a way to 
physically represent the increasing belief that we were one Cranbrook. And so Cranbrook was not six different institutions, but one single community with multiple component parts. And so if we recategorized ourselves to think of ourselves as one Cranbrook, then we also should have sort of a unifying scheme of graphic design, which Catherine and Michael McCoy did. And then we should also have a unifying light on our second little light fixture here. And so this one hasn't quite uh, turned on yet, but these little bollards have a steel cap on the front, and then they have this funny little steel reflector. And so that almost looks like it is the light, but in fact, that is the light is in here, and it's going to come through these perforations and then reflect off the painted white surface there. And some of these are over at the art museum and have just been repainted. This one is awaiting its paint job. And like so much of the Cranbrook landscape, it is a little overgrown at the moment. And so we find our Hoffman lights are hiding in the corner. Now, I don't actually, the record on these lights is a little bit um, Spartan. I do know that these lights are the last ones that he designed. They're the, certainly the most simple. They're also the last that were made at Cranbrook. And uh, the construction detail is really has this sort of beautiful, almost arts and crafts quality that you can figure out how it was built. So you can see all of these little nuts that clearly are anchoring these individual struts. It's holding up the, the lid, and then you have the sort of seal of the plate. And that all goes towards this arts and crafts idea that not only should the architect sort of coordinate the design of everything, but then we should also understand construction. And then an object will be more beautiful if we understand how it was put together. Now, this little guy is one of my favorites because of a very subtle detail that to uh, my walking around campus, I've only found this one place. And that is the Cranbrook Community logo that was designed at this moment in the late 80s that I was discussing the sort of idea of one Cranbrook. And so for the first time, we ended up with a Cranbrook Educational Community logo. It has the C for Cranbrook taken from Aliel Saarinen's Academy logo. Then it has a crane standing over a sort of abstracted river. And there are three lines to the river for schools, science, and art. Uh, K through 12 schools, the Institute of Science, and the Art Academy flowing into this one Cranbrook. And I'm not sure if Dan Hoffman, if this was uh, almost a prototype of this version, and so it got the special treatment of having the stamp in the concrete, or how exactly that happened. Of course, at the same time the light fixtures were being put up, all of the new signage was also being put up. This is a later version of the signage designed in the 90s, uh, but the signage is coordinated to whatever area of campus it's in. So here we're at Cranbrook Academy and we have the CA logo. Now, we're headed to our third of four lighting designs next, which I said the other one was my favorite, but now I look at these and they become my favorite again. So it just depends on where I am and what day of the week it is. Depends on what my favorite thing at Cranbrook is. But these are the fabulous potato chip lights. And one thing that links all of the Hoffman designed light fixtures together is that these were made at Cranbrook by the Cranbrook Architectural Office. Now, I say at Cranbrook, physically they were located at different points on campus, but then I think by the time they were actually going into production of the light fixtures, they had a little warehouse over on Long Lake Road. Uh, but it was, again, this idea that Cranbrook should be self-sufficient, that we should be a laboratory of design, but also a laboratory of making. And so we have wonderful pictures in the archives of all of these unpainted just steel tubes and then of the machines that would turn the tube to create uh, uh, this bend. And 
what I think is so clever about this lighting design is that it really has a very sculptural quality to it, especially as you see them sort of marching along the curve of the road. But also the largest part, the potato chip itself, is completely um, unelectrified. And so you're able to get this certain sort of floating quality, this thinness to the entire light fixture that wouldn't happen if that was actually providing the light. Of course, the light itself is coming out of the steel tube. And so uh, you can see the light fixture is, is right here and it shines the light up and it reflects it back down. If these were being retailed, if a lighting company was uh, marketing this, I'm not sure what kind of foot candle you get, what kind of spread you have. Uh, but the, the concern here at Cranbrook wasn't so much that you were lighting the sidewalk so that you could read a magazine as you sort of walked along. It wasn't any type of idea of sort of continuous illumination. Dan Hoffman thought of it as, as much more of a uh, lyrical and sort of poetic journey that he was creating these sort of guiding lily pads of light. So you ha would have a certain level of light here that would actually be quite dim so that you could still sort of see the nature. You wouldn't be blinded by bright right around the fixture and then super dark woods. So they're not the most efficient way to light something, uh, to shine the light up and reflect it back. But he wasn't really going for maximum efficiency. He was going for sort of guiding points of light leading you along the edge of the road. And again, the sort of celebration of construction where you can see how the piece is actually uh, nut and bolt going through to create the entire light fixture. And these were fairly recently repainted and are looking rather lovely. So on other Live at Fives, we talked about many of the things that I'm walking by, like the arrival feature here by Wani Palasma and Dan Hoffman. All of this done around the same time as the light fixtures. So I think the first light fixtures are installed about 1994. Uh, the last ones are going in about 1998. Um, I believe they were all designed by 1996, but when you are building your own light fixtures, you end up with a, a fair amount of um, uh, uh, lengthy li labor that goes into it as you're creating each piece. So the fourth light fixture that we'll see, the last one on our little Live at Five journey through the Cranbrook-designed light fixtures is the sort of Star Bollard. Now, I wish they had actual names. To my knowledge, Dan Hoffman did not ever name them. Uh, in the archives, we have wonderful little paper models of the light fixtures that have been flattened. Uh, we also have lots of sketches and we have different sort of measures of how tall they'll need to be to reflect light down. Uh, this is a light fixture that was designed especially for this road. And so this is the Woodward Access Road. This is how you get from the middle of campus, which is marked by the arrival feature that we just walked by. So it's how you get from the middle of campus back to Woodward Avenue. It was designed to keep visiting members of the public off of the city streets of Bloomfield Hills to get people off of Lone Pine Road and to coming into campus via Woodward Avenue. Now, there was a lot of discussion about should there be a sidewalk on this road? Maybe there should have been, but there's not. Should there be light fixtures? Are we sort of illuminating this for cars to drive down? Or are we doing what the decision ultimately was, creating again this idea of points of light? And so thinking of them almost like sort of little constellations that lead us down alongside the road, you can see that the bollards are pretty far apart and they're really not doing anything as far as function. That's going to come from the car headlight. Um, instead, what they're doing is they're marking the edge of the road in a very unique and very Cranbrook way. And basically, these are just rolled cones of steel that have been uh, uh, sort of water jet or plasma cut uh, with these perforations. And then the light is actually down here and it simply shoots up through the uh, uh, tube almost like a torch. And so 
at night, what you see is just the sort of reflected light. And as I move the camera around, you get a sense of sort of the drama of the piece. And so as you drive by, uh, you sort of see the lights, they twinkle as you go, and you're led from one little bollard to the next, all the way down to Woodward Avenue in this very carefully composed uh, sort of vehicular road that was designed uh, by uh, Johnson Johnson and Roy, along with Dan Hoffman and others, to, to give you that sort of Cranbrook experience of arrival, of being in a special place, of being in a unique community, even though you're in a car instead of on foot, which is the sort of Sarnen way of experiencing buildings. It's all about walking and going up and down stairs and sort of experiencing the campus on foot. What Dan Hoffman was trying to create and what he used his light fixtures for was to make a Cranbrook experience that would be entirely experienced or entirely uh, felt through the car at 30 miles an hour. So one question that I often get when I talk about these light fixtures on tours with uh, guests in person is they'll ask, you know, well, <laughs> students were making light fixtures for Cranbrook and paying tuition to attend Cranbrook. And that's not exactly true. So there was a model set up where students would either take a semester off and work on Cranbrook projects as paid employees, or they would do it in their summer when they were not enrolled at Cranbrook, or they would do it after they graduated. And so uh, uh, we weren't quite the medieval cathedral village where the master architect, in this case Dan Hoffman, was employing apprentices to do his design work. Um, it did cause some issues in the 90s. Um, it's probably why we don't have the same model set up today, uh, but, but there was this somewhat of a division between your studies as an architecture student at Cranbrook and your labor as an architecture student at Cranbrook. And there were certain people like uh, Ted Galante, uh, Theodore Galante, who uh, uh, spent a, even a longer time than his student years uh, uh, designing with Dan Hoffman and working physically for the architecture department. Now we saw the little stamp of the uh, Cranbrook community logo on the light fixture and here it is at a larger scale again on the back of one of the signs uh, from the mid-1990s and so again we have the three uh, uh, divisions of Cranbrook, the Cranbrook C and then the crane in the middle. Interestingly this one is stamped into the concrete but the stamp was the correct logo, which means that we're actually looking at the reverse of the logo. So this one is backwards. It's a problem that um, doesn't exist on other signs. Other signs are correctly oriented, including on the little light fixture. So just a sort of interesting error that you only get when you are hand making all of these elements. Had we just put an order in for all of these concrete and steel pieces. Uh, presumably whoever was making those off-site would have gotten them correct. Because so much of this was hand done and handmade at Granbrook, you end up with these moments that someone like William Morris would have said, well that's the whole point of hand making it, is that you have the sort of errors of construction, you have the, the craft of the, uh, uh, of the object reflected in the object. So Thanks so much for joining us for this little live at five. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you here on Instagram. I appreciated all of the feedback from last week and all of the people who have told me that you did miss me over on Instagram. So for the summer, I'll be back on Tuesdays at five here on Instagram for live at five and on Wednesdays, continuing on uh, Facebook at Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. If there's something that you would like to see discussed, uh, if there's an element of Cranbrook's history or design or architecture that you want to see explored, do send me a message here at Cranbrook Center and I will be sure to add it to my list. Until next time, this is Kevin Adkison with the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research why I chose to discuss lighting on the second longest day of the year where only a few of them came on, we'll never know. Perhaps this winter will come back where at five o'clock it's perfectly dark. Until then, 
I will see you next week for another Live at Five.